Welcome to the fourth and final Distinguished Faculty Lecture for the 2022-2023 academic year. Um, if you can please take your seats, we'll get started. There's lots of empty seats uh, in this area. I know people are pulling out some chairs in the back too. I'm the Provost, uh, Tricia Sirio, and I want to thank you for joining us today for this Distinguished Faculty Lecture, The After Effects of War in Contemporary Korean Art, presented by Young Min Moon, Professor and Chair of the Department of Art in the College of Humanities and Fine Arts. Before we begin today, I'd like to take a moment to just explain how this event will proceed. After Professor Moon's presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions. And then Professor Moon will be presented with the Chancellor's Medal, which is the campus's highest recognition. And at the conclusion of today's event, uh, we'll have a reception with a special menu prepared by UMass Dining, um, I believe, downstairs. Um, and a recording of this lecture will then be available on the Distinguished Faculty lecture website in the coming days. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Barbara Krauthammer, who serves as the Dean of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts. Dean Krauthammer, will you please introduce our distinguished lecturer? Good afternoon. We'll do it again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Very nice. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Young Min Moon to you. He is, as you know, a visual artist, a critic, curator, and art historian whose award-winning work reflects his experiences and understandings of migration across cultures. Born in South Korea, Young Min Moon received his um, master's in education from Harvard University and his master's in fine arts from the California Institute of the Arts. He's professor and chair of the Department of Art here at UMass Amherst, but has had a distinguished career as an educator, having held positions at Sogong University in Seoul, St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, and the New College of Florida in Sarasota. We're glad you're not there. Um, he is a brilliant creator, a generous educator, and a skilled leader, and has dedicated his career to creating beautiful and compelling works of art that reflect his awareness of the hybrid nature of identities that have been forged amid the complex historical and political relationships between Asia and North America. He's shown his art in many exhibitions in South Korea and across North America, including at CODIST in San Francisco, the Korea Society in New York City, as well as numerous prominent museums in South Korea. Closer to UMass, his work has been shown in the Smith College Museum of Art and the Carpenter Center at Harvard University. His work is held in the permanent collections of the Seoul Museum of Art, the Kumho Museum of Art in Seoul, and the CODIST Art Foundation in San Francisco, among many others. In addition to, to creating brilliant creative work, he's also a productive and distinguished critic and theorist. Professor Moon has published essays on contemporary Korean art in a wide range of publications. For example, his work appears in important volumes such as Contemporary Art in Asia, a critical reader that was published by MIT Press, and in A Companion to Korean Art, which is the first English language academic textbook on the history of Korean art. He's also written numerous exhibition catalogs and anthologies, including those published by the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Seoul and the Seoul Museum of Art. He curated the traveling exhibition, Incongruent Contemporary Art from South Korea, that was accompanied with a bilingual Korean and English publication. In addition to all of this, Professor Moon has received numerous awards, prestigious artist residencies, and competitive fellowships. He's the recipient of the Nanji Residency at the Seoul Museum of Art, a Massachusetts Cultural Council grant, a Canada Cultural Council grant, an Ontario Cultural Council grant, the Marion and Jasper Whiting Foundation Fellowship, 
And in 2014, he was awarded the highly competitive and prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship in recognition of his exceptional creative ability and his potential for continued excellence. And more recently in 2019, he was awarded the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant in recognition of his exceptional artistic work. And I want to also acknowledge that here at UMass in 2014, Young Min Moon received the UMass Amherst Award for Outstanding Accomplishment for Research and Creative Activity. And I don't know if you remember this, but this is where we first met. We were sitting next to each other in the ceremony. And I remember very clearly, one, how kind you were to me, um, and two, being so compelled by the description of your work in that ceremony and feeling like I wanted to get to know you. Um, so it's really been my pleasure and honor to get to know you and work with you over the past few years in the college. By all accounts, Professor Youngman Moon's art and scholarship are compelling and incisive, thoughtfully exploring the meaning of tradition, the aftermath of violence and loss, and the politics of mourning. Through his creative work and his research, he allows us all to contemplate the complexities of the human condition and to imagine new ways of being. Please join me in welcoming Professor Young Min Moon. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow. Uh Thank you so much, uh, Dean Krauthammer and Dean uh, Sirio. I'm sorry, Provost Sirio. <laughs> uh, that was really incredibly generous of you. Um, uh, I feel very flattered. I'm deeply honored uh, for this opportunity to share my work with you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, uh, for being here today. Um, um, as I've been saying, <laughs> I'm not so sure if I deserve this honor. Uh, but uh, because I know there are so many amazing faculty on this campus that are uh, more deserving than I am. Uh, so I'm very deeply honored. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank everyone behind the scenes to make this event possible. And uh, I really appreciate all the support that I received from UMass over the years. Um, and I'd like to say that I'm really grateful to my mother and my wife, June, uh, for their unwavering support over the years, and for June's parents, who have always been generous over the years whenever I visited Korea so that I could do my research. Um, I'm also indebted to the scholars that I'll be referring to, the artists whose work I'll be presenting today, and the numerous anonymous people who are represented in their work. And finally, I'd like to give this lecture in my memory of my father who passed away 25 years ago today, exactly. So I'd like to begin by recalling my childhood memories um, after immigrating, immigrating to North America in 1984. Uh, having come from a uh, society under an oppressive military regime, I was surprised to discover that most people I spoke to have never heard of the fearsome military dictators who wielded and condoned violence to maintain social order. Uh, moreover, most people didn't know where Korea was even located on the map, uh, even though the U.S. had a lion's share in the Korea's peninsula's uh, territorial division before the Korean War outbreak. In short, Korea was virtually unknown then, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, and the Korean War remains forgotten now. American soldiers um, deployed in the Korean War would remember a completely ravaged and devastated country. The U.S. dropped more bombs in, on North Korea alone than in the entire Pacific theater during all of the Second World War. Uh, today, Americans may associate North Korea with the historical famine in the 90s and its ongoing nuclear threats. The general U.S. population, and perhaps even some people who consider themselves progressive, naively believe North Korea is part of the axis of evil. As for South Korea, Americans may be enamored by their technological devices and sensational Korean pop culture phenomena. 
I'm certainly glad that South Korea has be, been recognized as an economic and cultural powerhouse today. But there is so much more that matters but remains little known outside Korea. They matter to Korea and the U.S. because the modern history of the two nations are inseparable. Today I present contemporary art from South Korea that grapples with the aftermath of the Korean War in the context of the Cold War. Their work creates a rupture in the master narrative of the Cold War and sheds light on the repercussion of the U.S. imperialism and military ambition in the local context. Specifically, the art reflects the ancient, I'm sorry, recent academic tendency to examine the Korean War, not so much from the perspective of diplomatic and political history, but through the experience of the ordinary people in the realm of intimate relationship and kinship. I aim to resituate re the narrative of the anonymous people's struggles and experiences from their obscurity to an essential part of the global Cold War history. Now, before introducing the art, I must touch upon the politics of the term, the Cold War. In his book, The Other Cold War, social anthropologist Honey Kwan points out that there is no consensus on the origin of the Cold War, as it has become subject to revitalized debate today. Unlike the multiple temporal identities now bestowed upon the Cold War's origins, however, rethinking historical perspectives regarding the end of the Cold War has not been granted. Excuse me. Um, contrary to the nearly universal belief that the Cold War was were ended after the fall of the communist bloc in 1989, it is not over on the Korean Peninsula. Citing the context of Korea and Vietnam as, quote, violent manifestation of the bipolar global order, end quote, Kwan argues that the war-induced wounds are deep, still deeply felt in the respective societies. In these countries, the Cold War has been neither a war at a distant place nor an imaginary one, but a real one. Indeed, the notion of the Cold War in singular presents a daunting semantic paradox. Given the organized violence, millions of casualties of the two wars, and the ongoing struggles with traumas in Asia. Denoting the long period of peace, the term is essentially a Eurocentric conception. So Kwan rightfully asks, quote, when we say the Cold War is over, whose Cold War and which dimensions of the Cold War do we refer to? And did the Cold War end the same everywhere? End quote. I would add, has the Cold War actually come to an end everywhere? This also brings us to the question of why the Korean War, why the Korea matters, and why is it called a forgotten war? And how might the artistic representation of its legacy be relevant to our understanding of the war? The Korean War is significant because it was the first war the U.S. engaged in at the outset of the Cold War. The war was catastrophic in the near complete devastation of the entire peninsula and the sheer number of casualties. It resulted up to 4 million deaths, of which nearly 70% were civilian deaths. Moreover, the war was a testing ground for America's new weapons, including napalm bombs. The U.S. military established its first permanent base abroad in South Korea, where almost 30,000 U.S. soldiers are still stationed today. Importantly, the Korea war, war, Korean War has not ended. The, Korea, uh, the two Koreas reached a stalemate after the intense conflict in the first year of the war, and they agreed on an armistice in 1953. So as there was no peace treaty, the two Koreas are still technically at war. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the truce. Despite the deep involvement of the U.S. in the conflict, Americans have forgotten the war. The belated attempt to honor the dead American soldiers on the Wall of Remembrance at the Korean War Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., may be missing about 500 names that should have been included. It also has more than 1,000 spelling errors in the names and includes nearly 250 names that are not related to the conflict. How do we explain such negligence, disinterest, and oblivion? 
The war was overshadowed by the Second World War and the Vienna War, and the latter marked the first war in the age of mass mediation through television. In contrast, the U.S. state censored the coverage of the Korean War because the imperial powers, such as the U.S., did not wish to remember such a brutal war that brought no victory but only huge losses and millions of casualties. In short, the Korean War was rendered invisible through intentional amnesia. As a result, the Korean War has yet to receive the level of global attention and academic inquiries given to the Second World War and the American War in Vietnam. What Americans do not perceive is that, in many ways, South Korea is a mirror image of its northern counterpart. Despite its democracy, democracy, advanced technology, and glamorous cultural products. From the 1950s to the early 1990s, South Korea shared multiple affinities with North Korea, such as the mutual rejection of the other's legitimacy, state terror, oppression, fear-mongering, state-controlled media, official nationalism, the elimination of dissidents, the displacement of people, the forced disappearance of quote-unquote abnormal people, such as the physically disabled, homosexuals, the racially mixed, etc. And then there's, of course, the problem of the excessive collectivization of memory through the construction of gargantuan statues, monuments, and memorial halls. So the politics of memory is even more significant given that uh, the disproportionate number of civilian casualties. South Korea began to diverge from North Korea significantly only in the post-dictatorship era of the 1990s when the commercial film industry capitalized on the repressed memory of the violent past, such as the Korean War and Gwangju Democratic Uprising, and on their other half, North Korea. So in response to yet another strand of excessively collectivized memory, this time fueled by capitalist interests, some artists began their critical response to such vulgar uses of collective traumatic memories. The artists that I present today refused to turn the violence of militarized modernity into oblivion. Rather than seeking consolation, empathy, or closure, they inscribe a new narrative through questioning investigation, and analysis. Their art resonated with me because they confronted the repressed memories of violence, loss, and mourning from my youthful years. Moreover, they grapple with the crises of historical subjectivity and kinship brought by, by the Japanese colonial and U.S. imperial powers and the succession of autocratic regimes. The former military dictator, Park Chung-hee, has produced many social underclass and subalterns. They include falsely accused communist sympathizers and North Korean spies, the Korean veterans of the Americans' war in Vietnam, minors and nurses dispatched to Germany in the 1970s in exchange for financial aid, homeless, juvenile delinquents, shamans, exploited underage factory workers, and camp town club workers and prostitutes serving American GIs. Uh, these subalterns were excluded even by Minjung, the grassroots people's pro-democracy and labor justice movement of the 1980s. These voiceless, anonymous people are the invisible ghosts behind the myth of the great modernizing success of South Korea, buried deep in the shadow of the Cold War. Um, actually, these glasses are not actually helping. Uh, fear dwells on the unknown. Um, growing up under the, mil the anti-communist military regime in South Korea in the 1970s, the three scariest words were communist, red, and spy. As a child, I was indoctrinated to believe that North Koreans literally had red flesh. Uh, after I immigrated to Canada, I was associated with a left-leaning Korean student group while attending a college in Toronto. When a man from North Korea invited the group for dinner, I could not resist my curiosity to meet a North Korean for the first time. And I was secretly but terribly embarrassed 
to see that the man looked nothing like a red devil, but an ordinary Korean man. The internalization of North Koreans as demonic beings was possible because the South Korean government successfully brainwashed the citizens and banned all the images of North Korea and its people throughout my childhood. Within the first decade after I left the country, South Korea established its first democratically elected government, lifting the ban on socialist and Marxist theories and allowed images of North Korea in the media. Subsequently, commercial films and TV dramas made sensational hits by ex exploring the improbable but much repressed interactions between the two Koreas. In this context, um, Yeah, I, I think I skipped a slide here. I just, just to show you uh, a typical large-scale memorial halls to drive a kind of collective, you know, nationalistic, ideologically based uh, understanding of the Korean history, like uniform history of Korea, Korean War. Uh, so in this context, the documentary film Repatriation was released to critical appraisal. Called from some 800 hours of footages shot over 12 years and condensed into only 150 minutes, this complex and powerfully moving film begins with the filmmaker Kim Dong-won's chance encounter with the former spies from North Korea who settled in his shantytown neighborhood in Seoul. These men, unconverted long-term prisoners, were subject to, subject to the notorious conversion scheme. They were tortured and coerced to renounce their loyalty to the North Korean regime and its Juche ideology or self-reliance. About 350 prisoners gave in and converted. 19 died because of the conversion scheme, while 102 had spent more than three decades of imprisonment for their refusal to do so. The most extended term served was 45 years. For these men to convert is to admit that South Korea is the only legitimate country on the Korean Peninsula. Having succumbed to torture, the, convert who, the converted was forced to confess his rationale for choosing to convert in front of his comrades in prison. And they were also coerced to speak through loudspeaker stacks aimed at North Korea across the DMZ and proclaim, I am so and so and I converted because I love Korea. While the unconverted would find such acts unacceptable, these were sheer humiliation for the converted himself. To borrow historian Monica Kim's analysis of the interrogation of POWs after the armistice, such a psychological warfare represents, quote, a shift from border fights to human subjects, from the struggle with territory to human interiority, end quote. Many people would wonder why anyone would want to return to North Korea, given many defectors' stories of harrowing experiences. Why did they refuse to give in? Why did they hold steadfast to their belief in and loyalty to the oppressive regime. Director Kim wonders, uh, an ordinary person would have succumbed to tortures in a few days or even minutes. What were they trying to uphold? Wasn't it better to sign the, the conversion pledge and get out to do greater things or carry out the mission? Instead, they answered, I couldn't abandon my political belief. It was for the people and the nation. Ultimately, Kim reckons ideology is not the only reason for their refusal. He writes, the most convincing answer I received was that the reason they held out lay in the very atrocity of the conversion scheme. The pain inflicted on them justified their resistance and gave them strength. Inhumane violence trample their human dignity and pride. To protect their human dignity, they had no choice but to fight, end quote. In short, their refusal to convert was not only a reflection of their loyalty to the northern regime, but also a triumphant 
courageous, courageous act in the face of organized political violence. Thus, we can surmise the basis of the unmistakable sense of shame revealed by this man, Kim Young-sik, who gave in to torture and converted. When Mr. Cho, one of his comrades, visits, Kim Young-sik sheds tears of embarrassment, humiliation, and lament his failure to stay awake during torture and refuse conversion. Kim proclaims that his forced conversion is not valid and continues to demand it to be repatriated until this day. The film is riddled with polemics of the shifting political landscape and its consequences. However, the director Kim maintains an honest portrayal of the long-term prisoners and his relationship with them. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I will refer to them as seniors from now on. Um, simultaneously, uh, despite the dozen years over which Kim has gotten to know them intimately, Kim shares that he intended to reveal that there remained an invisible wall between the seniors and the director himself. Kim is sympathetic and understanding of how one could occupy their political stance, yet he remains critical of both North and South Korean governments. He supports their repatriation, yet he was taken aback by their innocent praise of Kim Il-sung, the founding father of the Northern regime. He was also troubled by their denial of North Korea's abduction of South Korean civilians. Director Kim was fond of this particular man, Mr. Jo chang sun who became one of the leading characters in the film. Over the years, Jo became a father figure for Kim and a grandfather-like presence for Kim's children. Without saying much, he was always around and helpful. Due to his modesty, kindness, and selflessness in dealing with the village's affairs, which often required physically demanding labor, Kim naturally gravitated to, uh, towards Cho with genuine respect and affection. Kim believes that it would be futile to ask him or any of his comrades if they have ever regretted the life they had led. Yet Cho's political position ultimately takes him back to North Korea so that Kim could not re remain reunited with him. I am reminded of the inescapable paradox of one's relationship with an other, as succinctly pointed out by, posited by the artist Greg Bordovitz. Quote, one cannot be an I without an other, yet one cannot fully become identical with an other. Being for the other is an ethical ideal, absolutely necessary, fundamentally inescapable, and ultimately impossible, end quote. As the director himself found it compelling, if not difficult, it is for the viewer, too, to reconcile this jarring discrepancy between their compassionate appearance and the fact that they were staunch defenders of their ideology. Indeed, there are many instances of intimate personal relations that are both inextricably entwined with and defy the bipolar ideological condition. The director confesses that he learned the ethics of being human from the seniors. Among the most memorable includes his witnessing one senior confessing his loyalty to the, to the party on his deathbed. Another paying respect to yet another comrade in his dying moments, sir, you've done your best. Or Zhou chang -san collecting a small amount of the earth from the burial ground of his comrade when he was uh, killed uh, upon discovery by the Korean military. Even though these incidents involve politics and ideology, they are captured in the intimate private moments of the man in their most vulnerable conditions. And there are also many moments of joyous interactions. Um, I'm So here is a man uh, who discovers one of his comrades getting married at his old age. So he's being a little jealous. So, uh, so he's asked, you know, are you jealous? And of course I am. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so he expresses envy in a, in a childlike manner. And Kim highlights these moments to uh, empathize, uh, I'm sorry, em emph emphasize that they are just as human as we are. Although the seniors demanded to be repatriated to the North, Director Kim imagines that in the end, most of the seniors were ambivalent about 
repatriation in the end. Over many years, they have grown affectionate for many people, but their belief was rooted in North Korea, so they must have also wanted to return to North Korea. In short, they must have had mixed feelings about the return home. Among the unconverted long-term prisoners is Kim Sun Myung, this man, uh, second from the right, uh, who was born in South Korea, but joined the North Korean military before the outbreak of the war. As a result, his father and, and his brother were executed as rep- retribution. He holds the longest record of having spent 45 years in prison. Kim's family never visited him in prison and still denied him denied seeing him after he was eventually released. Through a human rights group's persistent effort, Kim was finally allowed to see his 93-year-old grandmother uh, in 45 years, but for only less than 30 minutes. Unfortunately, his mother passed away within one month after the reunion, and his family informed him of her death only after the funeral was over. Before his departure to the north, Kim Sun-myung attempted to visit his mother's grave in his hometown, but his family still denied him access. In the end, he abandoned his search and left in bitterness. Even in the age of the sunshine policy towards the north and the reconciliatory mood after the prospect of repatriation, a deep rift between them was still palpable. One of the most lasting tragic legacies of the Korean War is the phenomenon of separated families. The historian Nan Kim makes an astute observation. The most profound form in which a dividing boundary has been reproduced on the peninsula is not on land or paper, but within the intimate space of the family. End quote. Indeed, the social stigmatization of the communist sympathizers' family manifested in a painful crisis of kinship. Since the end of the violent conflict in 1953, the two Koreas have imposed strict prohibitions against all forms of communication between civilians on both sides of the border. This means that Koreans have been unable to verify whether their missing kin had survived the, the cataclysm of the war. At the armistice in 1953, an estimated 1.7 million Koreans are said to have missing families across the border. The disintegration of the families owes to the court's conscription and the radically shifting front lines during the violent struggles, forcing civilians to accept conscription or make spur-of-the-moment decisions to flee for safety. What they hoped to be a temporary but urgent departure turned out to be a permanent exile from their homeland, or I'm sorry, their origins, after the border has become entrenched. Unable to ascertain their kin's existence, the meaning of war death has remained destabilized for Koreans. In 1983, the national television Korean broadcasting system offered a special program to help separated families find their missing kin by allowing family members to briefly appear on television holding a handwritten sign with names and description of the kin they were looking for. Due to an unexpected surge of demands by tens of thousands of people who descended upon the broadcasting station, the program Finding Separated Families ended up airing every day for nearly five months, drawing over 100,000 applicants, resulting in over 10,000 successful reunions and achieving 78% share of ratings at its peak. The program was arguably a precursor to reality TV, as the Korean population was transfixed by the real-time reunion of families in three decades. Using split-screen technology, members participated in the the process of confirming their identity. The most compelling scenes included the participants learning their parents had already died revealing these most intimate, devastating private moments transpiring in real time on national television. 
It must be noted that all participants in the reunion program resided within South Korea. After the closing of this program, there had been no remarkable pro progress in reuniting families until the year 2000. A significant outcome of the historic summit, joint summit held that year was North-South Separated Family Exchange Visits. The two Korean governments arranged an exchange of, of sending 100 North Korean visitors to Seoul and another 100 South Korean visitors to Pyongyang, each visitor meeting their family for four days. Since all forms of communication had been banned for the, over five decades, most of the families who were invited for the exchange had long assumed that their missing kin in the North were dead. Hence, the shock and disbelief among the participants when they were notified to participate in the exchange program. The reunion was orchestrated in the aftermath of the 1997 Asian financial crisis in South Korea and the historic famine in North Korea. Thus, the reunion in 2000 was staged as a political ritual to usher in a new era of reconciliation and prosperity. Despite the context of the political economy behind the event, it was the watershed moment that countered the long chokehold of, of anti-communism and the perpetuation of North Koreans as demonic enemies. Recalling the conf conflict between the law of the state and the ethics of kinship in the epic tragedy of Antigone by Sophocles, many Koreans, perhaps hundreds of thousands of them, have been deprived of the ability to mourn their beloved, in part because of their fear of the state and social stigmatization associated with North Korea, and because they were uncertain whether they were alive or dead. Since the armistice, families with their kin associated with North Korea meticulously guarded their family ties and dared not seek seeking them out due to the grave consequences, which included violent interrogations, police surveillance, an impediment to state employment, and hindrance to upward mobility. Then, in the summer of 2000, the families suddenly found themselves catapulted from their obscurity onto the national stage, revealing their very ties that they had tried so hard to conceal for decades. Since the reunions in 2000, there have been 21 occasions of additional reunions held almost every year. But the reunions always lasted only several days, and time is running out for most people who are old enough to remember their missing kin. I, it is said that maybe in the next three or five years, most of the people who have applied for these uh, reunion chances will have passed away. Um, Yeah, moreover, uh, while the reunions were celebrated as harbinger of national reunification, it also reinforced the sense of the border that permeated the lives of these impacted families. What you're seeing may appear to be a conventional family port uh, portrait photographed in a studio, but it is not. It is an experimental portraiture, pushing the limits of representation. The series of photographs entitled Eternal Family by Byun Sun Chol emerges from this unresolved task of reuniting fragmented families across the border. The subjects in Byun's families are not, uh, I'm sorry, the subjects in Byun's photos are the families who are not given an opportunity to reunite with their missing kin. Presumed, uh, presumed to have crossed the border to the north. Uh, with the help of Red Cross Korea, Byun contacted about 2,000 families who were actively seeking their missing kin in North Korea. The single most important cr criterion was identifying families with some form of photographs of their family. Out of 2,000 families, only about 1%, or about 20 families, had in their possession a photo or a few other missing kins when migrating from the north to the south during the chaotic events of the Korean War. Given that 70 years have passed since their migration, preserving a photo itself must have been no easy task. In this case, the owner asked 
an artist to produce a drawing based on the parents, his parents' photo because of the photo's fragility and fear of losing it. So the process involves the following. First, Byung photographed each participant as they held their photos. Typically, the persons they wished to meet again were their parents and siblings. The artist then recruited South Korean senior models and photographed them alone or standing next to the participants. Then the artist obtained a photo of the aged kin sought after by using the face aging software developed by the Korean Institute of Science and Technology. The software utilized the data gleaned from many photographs of Koreans by examining their morphology, wrinkles, and change in skin tones, etc. Originally intended to aid in finding missing persons and criminal suspects, the AI program needs only a single photo to produce multiple image of, images of a single person aging up to the age 80. The accuracy rate of the reconstruction is said to be about 80%. Subsequently, the artist replaced the model's face with a new image of the face produced through the software. Finally, the hybrid image of the computer-aided face imposed onto model's body would be subject to labor-intensive photo-retouching and manipulation processes to arrive at a compelling portrait of the missing person after more than 50 years. The exhibition prints are often larger than size, even revealing minute details of pores and facial hairs. One is struck by the temporal lapse embodied in these photographs. Among the three photos this gray-haired man holds is a photo of his father, visibly younger than himself, about, by about 50 years. Fast forward to a cent, uh, half a century reveals his father suddenly aged, old enough to be the father of the man next to him. But the interval between the two points in time is entirely missing. These images occupy the liminal space between the north and the south, between the past and present, between the real and the imagined, or longed for. The uncanny aspect of the work stems from the fact that they appear powerfully convincing without having an actual physical referent. They are hyper-real and virtual at once, not only because they are computer-aided reconstruction, but also because their presence is uncertain, as their survival itself is uncertain. They are an embodiment of the dreams of the family yearning for their missing kin. What do these reconstructed portraits mean for the family? Would they regard it as the way religious believers regard sacred images, perhaps, as an embodiment of their kin's spirits? Do the photos provide the family some sense of comfort in finally knowing what their missing kin might have looked like after five decades of uncertainty? Probably so. Do the photos alleviate the anxiety of life of the uncertainty? Perhaps not entirely. The work becomes a proxy for an unrealizable reunion. For some, despite that it was a computer-aided imagery, it may even take on a magical property, perhaps like a guardian angel or talisman. The advancement of digital technology has posed a fundamental challenge to the indexical aspect inherent in photography. That is, photography as evidence of that which has existed. But Byung's portraits, though it was digitally manipulated, in fact produced the opposite result. The portrait took on an indexical imprint of the missing kin, even conjuring an aura of the person to the extent that one of the participants, this son, could not leave the gallery area even after the show's closing because he felt his, his parents or their spirits remained in the space. Has the uncertainty of the parents' death over the past five decades remained an abstract concept for him? Has the portrait's appearance finally allowed him a legitimate occasion to mourn given the palpable return of the repressed, that is, the object of bereavement? However, as these photos are essentially an illusion, they may have resulted in disillusionment 
for the families after providing them with temporary consolation. Just as the temporary reunions reinforce the sense of the border, the photos may also have had an unintended emphasis on the impossibility of reuniting with their beloved. In closing, I begin this talk by questioning the universally accepted notion of the end of the Cold War. I examine the enduring effects of the Korean War on its ordinary people and their lived experience in intimate relationships, and the crisis of kinship precipitated by by the locally specific political realities. It was the Korean War as part of the global hegemonic struggle that obstructed the task of intellectual and subjective work of decolonization and deimperialization after the Second World War and the liberation from Japan. The significance of these artists' work lies in their opposition to engineered amnesia through their re-engagement with the unfinished task of mourning by revealing how ethics of kinship is inseparable from the geopolitics of the Cold War and the law of the state. Engaging with these images of the unconverted long-term prisoners and the reconstructed family portraits is an attempt to navigate the, quote, emotional ruins of the Cold War, end quote, to borrow Joseph Masco's words, and to recall, remember, and honor the forsaken, the forgotten, and prison dead. It is also a way of disentangling the knotted, unspoken grief, as the Korean notion of Han illustrates. However, forgetting is also an unavoidable human condition. But amnesia, when it is deliberately manufactured, is, I believe, a form of violence. Importantly, these artworks refuse to call for unity under nationalistic fervor. The monuments and memorial halls of the Korean War may have been a form of premature collective mourning. By contrast, the art that I present today does not offer healing or closure per se to the collective trauma of the war. Instead, they confront the trauma, the very wounds that resulted from the division. They suggest the difficulty, if not impossibility, of coming to terms with the past and even imply that it may be fine to not have closure or resolution and remain melancholic in the sense that melancholia is a form of sustained mourning and grief. We now understand that continued mourning and grief is not pathological, but rather they help us maintain an active and creative engagement with the difficult past to open up the genuinely democratic futures. For South Korea, Uh, The five decades following the end of the Second World War had been a turbulent era in which families and kin groups were subject to rapidly shifting ideological environment amid the bifurcating global political order. During the same period, like elsewhere, two Koreas saw the elevation of the notion of the nation state and the associated waning of kinship. In this context, I'd like to end by quoting Honey Kwon, who writes that kinship is quote, eminently a political concept. The idea of kinship is a political concept in the specific historical sense that addresses how the milieu of human intimacy became the primary target of the politics of the Korean War and how it continues to be a vital site of the state's disciplinary action throughout the long Cold War. It is also a public concept in the sense that it is open to possibilities that the moral morality of kinship plays a meaningful role in the public world and even in reshaping this world into a more democratic form. End quote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Moon, for that very moving presentation. I'm, I'm really um, very deeply moved by the power of art in, in this space and the lost intimacy, the grappling with that, uh, especially centered around families. Thank you very much for that. Thank you.
Um, I uh, would like to open up uh, the discussion to questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and someone will bring you a microphone. And I'll let Professor Moon call on those with questions. I thought it was over, but. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> Almost. Any questions? Yes, Stephen. art uh, world in Korea, like the musical world and cultural world, is broader than, than this, what, vein of uh, recognition. I'm curious uh, what the kind of commercial side of the art world is in contrast to this and how it, rep it represents a different kind of, uh, you know, understanding of the history uh, is there, and is it generational? Can you just address a little bit sure. the context of this yes. and the wider? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So, um, as you know, I mean, I, as I alluded in the paper, uh, South Korean popular culture has been enjoyed by many people across the whole entire globe. Uh, which is to say uh, their culture, co contemporary culture, is very much, they share the global language. And I think uh, it's probably safe to say that much of the contemporary Korean art being practiced today uh, used uh, similar kinds of vocabularies and languages and looks of contemporary, quote-unquote, contemporary art, where if you simply show the art, you might not be able to tell the citizenship of the artist who happens to be a Korean artist. And I think... That is normal, and that is okay. Uh, but I think, uh, as you talked about this uh, word generational, uh, I think it is also quite possible that a lot of contemporary, I mean, young Korean artists, not only artists, but young people in general, might not be so familiar with uh, Korean history, including Korean War. Whenever I say North and South Korea used to be mirror images, people are quite surprised including Koreans and Korean Americans. Um, uh, so I feel that there are enough, I mean, personally, there are enough artists who uh, use and share the contemporary global language of contemporary art. And I take it upon myself. Uh, I don't know if it's my thing with this being an immigrant. You know, people think that, or people say that, you know, when you immigrate from another one place to another, you sort of, sort of stay in that time, the era when, when you left the country, right? And this has been a kind of ongoing, lifelong uh, interest and commitment of mine uh, because it was not a very healthy uh, and normal uh, way of, you know, growing up, you know, military uh, society uh, where, or militarized society. Because uh, I remember going to schools, like an elementary school, and the top of the building would have these banners in red, like beat the commies down or you know destroy the North Korean regime in bold face, uh, and and you know seven eight year nine year old child going to school reading that violent you know uh, imperative, you know what does that do to your child you know child's you know brain? Uh, so for me, uh, you know, again I feel there's enough out there that shares the Korean I mean contemporary global art language and. Uh, I'm part of the sort of, you know, left-leaning critical artists who continue to grapple with these issues. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Uh, I'll go with, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for your talk, Professor Moon. Um, I know you've written extensively about the Mingjiang movement, and you mentioned it in your talk. And I was wondering, um, first, how Mingjiang artists have also dealt with the questions of kinship. And number two, I was also wondering um, if you could talk a little, I was curious, how are the politics of envisioning a kind of democratic future different for these artists that you've introduced today as opposed to the Mingjiang artists? I see. The first and second generation. Okay. All right, uh, thank you for that question. 
That, that would require probably another occasion, like another paper perhaps. I mean, Minjung, uh, what she refers to is the, the word that I once referred to in the paper, meaning like people, common people, ordinary people, grassroots. And there was a 1980s Minjung art movement associated with general Minjung democratic, pro-democracy movement and labor movement in the 1980s that effectively and in fact actually over, you know, contributed to overthrowing the military regime. Uh, now, to sort of you know, put it in a nutshell, Minjung art had its own complications and paradoxes. And there's one side, one faction of Minjung art which was like more like an avant-garde artist who was making critical practice and made art objects that were shown in white cube, traditional gallery space. And then there's another strand that came later uh, who were uh, more community-based, you know, engaging with common people. And uh, they tried to relinquish their authorship by collaborating with, you know, common folks and students and factory workers and and non-artists, basically. So their ideologies or their stance kind of clashed throughout the time. Uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, Minjung art sort of died away, dwindled, and then uh, the so-called this global contemporary unity was introduced to South Korea. Until that time, South Koreans were not able to freely travel outside of the country. So suddenly in the 90s, you know, students returning from uh, study abroad and inviting, uh, f you know, well-known artists and curators from outside in Europe and America to organize majors, you know, exhibitions and biennials and so on, uh, Korean contemporary art scene radically changed. And the artist, the, um, I would say the filmmaker, Kim Dong-won, that I showed today would you know, probably identify with the Minjung movement because uh, even though he comes from a well-to-do family, he took it upon himself to really live in that uh, uh, environment. You know, his one of the earliest uh, film was called uh, Sangyedong Olympics, meaning like Sangyedong is a, a name of the uh, one of the shanty town that was you know raised over to prepare for the 1980 Summer Olympics. Uh, so, you know, he lived there for a long time and documented that film, uh, the, 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 the process of eviction. Uh, so he, I would say, yeah, I mean, Kim Dong-won would share those principles and premise of the kind of, you know, people-based, community-based uh, act, activism uh, as, as art. While uh, uh, the photographer, I, I haven't asked him about that question, about his relationship or positionality relative to Min Jung, but my guess is that he would uh, identify himself as a photographer first and foremost, and that he's interested in people. He has done many different series of depicting different types of groups of people, uh, and this is an extension of it. Uh, but certainly, you know, he, you know, the political impetus is clearly there. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you so much um, for your talk, Professor Moon. Um, you made a mention of kinship as a political idea, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on that, especially because I understand that one of the most commonly cited reasons for um, supporting Korean reunification is you know, just that kinship, the idea that because the North Korean people and the South Korean people, we are one people, therefore we must also be one country. Yeah. I was, um, I would be very grateful if you could just share some of your thoughts sure. on that. Uh, it, that. That's a great question. Uh, uh, probably the toughest question so far. <laughs> uh, I think kinship uh, has to do with fundamental right to belong to your natural you know, group of people, as well as to take care of them. Uh, I suppose, you know, over the, you know, time, um, the notion of kinship might have sort of evolved to an extent where even if you are not blood related, you know, by, uh, through this process of sharing food and other stuff, materials, substances, uh, over a long period of time, you 
become or you develop this kind of kin-like relationships, right? Um, and I think uh, perhaps to go back to what I was saying about how there might be only three or five years left for these people, the seniors. Uh, since year 2000, about 130,000 people have applied to be re considered for re reunion. And over the past 18 years, um, about, uh, I guess, about 65,000 people have left, are left. The remainder have passed away. Uh, so this fundamental rights to belong to the family has been sort of deprived, uh, you know, by these political forces, right? And in the context of Korea, which is the kind of, you know, which remains the hot, you know, kind of flashpoint of the geopolitics and the uh, uh, superpowers' national interests, uh, the you know the kinship itself is, is you know no longer becomes something that you could have yet at your control. I mean, that, that was a tremendous talk. Thanks so much. I mean, full of the compassion that you have. Thank you. Uh, in, in relation to the last question, I mean, I have some reflections. I'm not sure if what I've got is a question, but it feels to me that. Um, Part of the issue, in a way, which is involved in your talk is not only how we relate to kin, but how we relate to people who are not kin. And after a while, in a world of division, kinship can be divided. And I was struck really by the, the sort of quest for identity and where technology comes into this. And for some reason, I was thinking about artificial intelligence, because here we have photographs that are constructed in some form, you know, reimagine things. Um, the seniors that you speak about, uh, the unconverted, hold on to an idea, I think, of authenticity, of not wanting to give that up. And then there are the people who are in search of kin, who maybe will never be found, and they get some artificial version of it, you know, and what it, that induces is a sense of finding, but also a sense of melancholy. And that word melancholy was something that really struck me as you were talking, that it really described the overall mood that, that, that you were evoking. And so it feels to me that um, what you're talking about in Korea has applications not only in Korea, but, but for others as well. I've spent a lot of time uh, in my work thinking about boundaries and borders, and Korea is, the, is defined north and south by, by a border, a boundary between them. And so the question is, you know, how do we find some, some form of authenticity, if you like, or real selfhood, um, not in separation from others, but in some, some place of encounter which isn't artificial um, and which isn't artificial in the other way because borders are artificial constructs. Um, and that work of, of, um, of reconnecting, whether one is kin or not kin, uh, is a real challenge, I think, in the world, you know, for, for everybody. As I say, I think this, I'm not sure if this is a question, but it's a reflection prompted by your talk, so thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Moon. That was a very uh, interesting highlight of the very painful era in, in a small kingdom in the distant part of the universe. Um, I think your reflection of the symmetry is interesting because my family reflects the opposite mirror that you were talking about. My family come from North Korea, mm. but I grew up in South Korea, as you have. In this, I think we're contemporary. Yeah. And I was pretty sure what North Koreans look like because everyone around me were North Koreans. Mm. But what's one of the interesting things is that um, most of my family have moved to America. Often I'm asked, why didn't your family move to America? It's a very complex question. Yeah. And part of it is that, uh, that, that my, my family didn't feel the sense of belonging in South Korea. And, and it's common among many of the people of my family and extended families. And so in, in your story, I'm, I'm finding it interesting because you're, you're painting a picture from the other side. Um, I, I don't know how my family would have painted the same picture, but it is a very complex one. Yeah. So for example, um, did any of the artists that you, you, you talked about, are, they, are any of them uh, refugees or families that are refugees? They may have a you know, different take on the same question. Um, and also yeah. there's a, a, this is not a, a, a story that will end in five years because right. almost all of my elders have passed away. Yeah. But I'm going to have to live with that legacy and my children too. 
And I think this, many of the Korean Americans living in, in America, North America, are families who share my kind of uh, heritage as well and the history. And we all have shared the same sense of history. Yeah. So I think this is an ongoing story, yes. not necessarily an end. And, and I have my own small imprint on campus, but there are others who have similar imprint in, in the country and, and the world as all. Well. I, I have a very different sense of my identity simply because I have very different, very complicated, I have no idea <laughs> who, who are my relatives are in North Korea. Mm. But it always puts me in the, in, the, in the place where I have to question that and ask that. Yeah. And, and that, I think that makes me more of a, a, a citizen of the world. Yeah. And the kinship, I would define it a bit broader. So I think there's a little more story you can tell. There's a lot more story you can tell to this very heartbreaking story that you've told today. And thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. I truly appreciate it. Thank you again uh, for your engagement and your questions and your uh, attendance here today. I hope we can continue the conversation downstairs at the reception. But before that, um, I want to share uh, Chancellor Subhaswamy's regrets that he couldn't be here this afternoon. He was called away to a Board of Trustees meeting. Um, and so that means that I have the distinct pleasure of um, sharing the Chancellor's Medal with Professor Moon. Uh, and this is the highest honor uh, afforded to a uh, faculty member on the UMass Amherst campus. So congratulations.